Good evening, everyone. Hello and welcome to Stonehouse for this evening's Arboricultural Association Wednesday webinar. My name's John Parker, Chief Exec at the Arb Association and your host for this event. Tonight is the second of our special webinars with Forest Research, where we're taking a closer look at trees, mental health and well-being. We'll soon be hearing from Liz O'Brien and Joe Barton. But as ever, first of all, a little update from us first. Some of you are already saying hello in the chat. Well done. Um, please keep those comments coming in. Let us know where you're watching from, but select everyone when you do so. Submit your questions using the Q&A button. We'll get through as many as we can at the end. But if I manage to miss yours, then please feel free to email me, john at trees.org.uk, and we'll pass any questions and everything over to our speakers afterwards. We don't have a webinar next week because we're basically flat out working on sorting out conference for this year, the first ever Arb Association online amenity conference. If you enjoy our webinars, then you're going to bloom in love conference. Think of it as 14 hours of Arb Association webinars over two days, featuring 26 speakers talking on a range of subjects under the same broad theme of trees and society. If you're a member of the association, then these 14 hours of top-notch CPD will cost you £150. You'll exclusively be able to watch any presentation you might have missed for several months afterwards before they become available to everyone else. For non-members, the price is £195. If you're planning to book a ticket but haven't done so yet, then why not do it tonight? Get on with it. Come on. Something else you could do tonight is to nominate someone for one of our two brand new awards, the results of which will be announced at conference. Young Arborist of the Year Award is sponsored by Lockhart Garrett and will recognise someone under the age of 35 who works in arboriculture in the UK and who shows outstanding passion for the profession, has achieved something particularly wonderful or has been effectively spreading awareness of arboriculture to the general public. The second award is for the Student of the Year and is sponsored by Tree Life. This award is to open to anyone of any age who's studying arboriculture or urban forestry in the UK and who's shown outstanding drive and passion to develop their knowledge and skills or has produced an impressive piece of work in the last year. You can nominate via our online form very easily with just some basic information. There's nothing wrong with nominating yourself if you think you're deserving of an award. There's great prizes, but you need to get a name into us soon because the deadline is at the end of this week. So at the end of this week or over the weekend, we'll probably accept stuff as well, but please get something in. Any questions, email me at john at trees.org.uk. Final notice, no webinar next week, but we're back the following week on September the 1st with a pair of presentations from our friends at Perennial, a charity which we've supported for some time now, which does amazing things to help those who work in arboriculture or horticulture when times get tough. Uh, we'll be joined by Head of Casework, Helen Waddington, and Ben Preston, who's the head gardener at Perennial's York Gate Gardens site. I was lucky enough to visit York Gate Gardens a couple of weeks ago for the Perennial AGM in Leeds. Uh, I had a guided tour from Ben, and at the end of which, I immediately invited him to come and speak at one of our webinars. It's going to be really great. Helen and Ben, both brilliant. So please, hopefully we'll see you there in two weeks' time. So onwards to tonight. Two great speakers, the first of which I'm very pleased to invite to the stage. Liz, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, John, and welcome, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so, yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Liz O'Brien. I'm head of the Social and Economic Research Group at Forest Research. Really pleased to be here this evening to talk to you about some of the health and well-being benefits of trees, woods and forests and why that's important for the future of treescapes management. So what I'd like to cover in my talk this evening is just to start with a bit of background context, then uh, move on to talk about the different health benefits of connecting with forests and green space, and then just touch on a couple of kind of different greening of different uh, settings to improve health and well-being before talking about engagement with green space during COVID-19, um, which has obviously had a huge impact on everyone and then finishing off with the importance of kind of cross-sector collaboration. So that's what I'm going to cover this evening. So just to kind of start with, um, there's increasing, I'm just going to move some of the things that I can see on my screen. Um, there's a great importance of forest and green space for health is increasingly recognised in a range of kind of policies and strategies. So increasingly green space is mentioned in health strategies. 
Um, we've got these publications that you can see from the World Health Organization talking about green space interventions uh, and the importance of green space and you know, options for action. And there's a huge amount of evidence and research taking place at the moment as well. And also quite a lot of uh, evaluations of interventions that are trying to create projects that improve people's health and well-being through that connection with um, green spaces. And increasingly, the focus is on kind of forest and green spaces um, in towns and cities or surrounding towns and cities, um, as increasingly, you know, urban populations you know, need to engage with these spaces for a whole variety of reasons. And globally, we are becoming sort of urban uh, across the world, but particularly in the UK. Uh, so there's increasing focus as well on um, the importance of preventing ill health and also on addressing some of the inequalities in health, as well as inequalities in accessing green spaces. So just to kind of give, give a bit of background in terms and context, in terms of kind of well-being and our health in general, um, not just covering mental ill health, but other aspects as well. Um, but mental ill health is now the single largest cause of disability um, in the UK. And the cost of healthcare um, is billions of pounds a year. So it's a huge issue for us, but it's not just about mental health. Physical inactivity is also um, important. I mean, physical activity is important. And about a third of the population in the UK is not physically active enough to improve their health and well-being. Um, and we've also become more overweight and obese as a society. Um, and these are things that need kind of looking at. We also have children, young people who are suffering from developmental, emotional and behavioural problems. Um, so there are kind of opportunities to kind of focus on these issues. And I think there's a whole kind of renewed focus on this because of the pandemic. There's lots of concerns about people's mental well-being, but also about well-being more broadly beyond mental well-being. So just to touch on that sort of COVID impact, um, this is data from the Office of National Statistics in the UK. Um, and it just outlines the kind of anxiety that people have been facing since we started the lockdown in March last year. Um, and some survey work that they've undertaken really highlights the sort of things that people are anxious about, so that concerns about people's personal well-being. You know, are they going to get COVID? Is my family going to get it, friends? What about job security? Am I going to be able to keep the job that I've got? You know, will I be furloughed? Uh, if I'm furloughed, will I get back into my job later on? And then also the impact of COVID-19 on people's finances. So I'll come back a bit later in the talk to talk about kind of the impact of COVID on our engagement with green spaces, but that gives you a bit of sort of background to that. So within this focus on green spaces and health, there's a really strong focus on trees and forests. Um, and I've been involved in a number of European networks. Um, and there was one uh, organized by Forest Europe. Uh, we carried out a review looking at human health and sustainable forest management. And in the publication, we use this diagram and it just kind of illustrates how contact with the nature um, can lead to a range of benefits that improve people's health and well-being. Um, so it depends on the kind of type and size of that green space or nature space, what sort of activities people are doing there, and the frequency and duration of those activities. Um, but that can lead potentially to reduced exposure to air and noise pollution, and can uh, reduce st stress and improve physical activity. And it's also a place where we can make social contact with others, whether that's people we know or people we don't know. Um, and also contact with green spaces can strengthen the immune system through that contact with biodiversity. And all of these link things can kind of contribute to our health and well-being. Um, and on a visit to green space, you may be getting all of these benefits or some of them, depending on what you're doing, where you're going, the type of space that it is. Um, a few years ago, uh, the Forest Trees and Human Health book was created from a different European network and more recently the Urban Forest book, which focuses also on kind of broader green infrastructure, um, also had a chapter on health and well-being 
And then the latest publication, The Forest for Public Health, uh, came out from a conference in Greece in 2019. So I'm just going to touch on the psychological benefits of forests and green spaces and then go on to just touch on the physical activity benefits, uh, physiological benefits and social contact benefits. So there are a whole range of kind of studies and benefits being identified, uh, research um, going on and being updated all the time. So I won't be covering anything, everything, uh, but it will give you a chance to um, get the sort of um, background. So there is evidence of the mental health benefits of connecting with green spaces, and that can be around influencing of positive emotions. So getting out into green spaces uh, to kind of feel better. But also there's that contribution potentially to helping with stress reduction, with depression, anxiety, tension that we may have. Um, and that can be really important in the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment with the pandemic. But also um, in terms of kind of mental well-being and psychological benefits, um, getting out into green spaces and forests can really improve people's attention and reduce the kind of cognitive load. So as we go through our kind of daily life, um, when we're working, we're focusing and concentrating, that really is quite fatiguing and getting out into green spaces can really help to restore some of that attention and to... Um, yes, help with depleted resources and help our cognitive thinking. There's also evidence mounting about um, that proximity to green spaces may be a good predictor of people's physical activity. Um, and exercising in green spaces can also kind of build strength and agility and improve our sense of well-being. Um, there's some evidence for children as well that urban green space is associated with increased physical activity and a lower risk of obesity in children. Um, but I think that there's quite a lot of heterogeneity in these studies. Um, so not all of them are reporting that proximity to green space is increasing physical activity. So it's kind of mixed view. Um, but many of the studies don't actually go into any detail about the characteristics of the forest and green spaces that are being studied. So we don't know, you know, what that forest or green space is like, you know, what sort of um, different types of vegetation within it, the biodiversity levels, what sort of infrastructure is available to engage and encourage people to use it for physical activity. Um, if we go on to think about the kind of physiological benefits, there's some evidence that living in greener environments is associated with a reduced risk of different physical morbidities. And there's quite a lot of research going on, particularly focused on forests, showing that even quite small amounts of engagement can lead to uh, lower blood pressure, uh, reductions in pulse rate and cortisol levels and suppress, help to suppress our sympathetic nervous system. So that's our kind of flight and fight response and can help to improve our parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system, which is our kind of rest and recovery. There's quite a lot coming out from Asia in this area, particularly focused on forests from Japan and South Korea and China. So focused quite a lot on the concept of forest bathing uh, or Shinrin-yoko, as it's called, so that the idea of bathing in the forest environment. Um, and that's often very much sort of um, linked to ideas of mindfulness, so spending time in a forest environment, taking notice of all your senses, taking notice of what's around you, rather than going into the forest to do lots of physical activity. Um, so, yeah, social benefits as well of accessing green space. And I think there are fewer studies undertaken on social benefits than the studies that are looking at kind of mental and physical health. But there is evidence that um, contact with nature, forests are important places where people can share experiences with families and friends. Uh, some correlational work from the Netherlands looked at the amount of green space um, and found that areas with less green space was associated with that perceived levels of lack of social support and loneliness, and also some work with older people. Again, that green spaces can help to reduce isolation and loneliness. 
There's also a whole range of kind of interventions that are going on that could be walking groups, green prescriptions, um, environmental volunteering, uh, those sorts of things um, can really uh, be opportunities for people to have social contact with others, people they know, people that they know, meet and become friends with. And you can also think about some of the kind of micro social contacts that people might have in green spaces and forests. You know, going out into that sort of environment, passing somebody and just saying hello, um, that sort of small amount of contact can really also have an impact. And then there's a whole range of events and activities that can bring communities together and help to improve social cohesion uh, and can also have an influence on social inclusion in deprived areas. So those are some of the um, benefits of connecting with green space for health and well-being. Um, but what I've touched on as I kind of talked about that is that some of the studies don't really go into detail about the characteristics and types of um, green spaces. Um, so, it, you know, they might say it's a park or a forest, but they really don't go into a lot of detail about what type of park and forest that is, for example. Um, so another European network that I got involved in with a request from the French government to look into the characteristics of green and blue spaces in urban and peri-urban areas um, and the impacts of those on mental well-being. So we got a group together, carried out a systematic review. Um, and what we found was that there's not a lot of evidence out there at the moment and a lot of the studies do just focus on, you know, it was a park or it was a woodland or grassland or it was, um, you know, a green pocket park or something like that. They didn't really go into a lot of detail about the characteristics of those spaces. So there's still more work to be done in that area. But we did find that um, from the evidence that parks, forests, grasslands and other green spaces can all improve mental health and that places with higher biodiversity generally resulted in better mental health outcomes. And I'm sure Jo will be touching on this in her talk a bit later. And that also we were looking at blue space, so direct exposure to the coast also showed consistent positive mental health benefits. Uh, that report, well, two reports, one on the green space, one on the blue space is now out. And I think I've provided, um, um, yeah, the, the link to that so you'll be able to get that and part of that report is now kind of condensed uh, by the World Health Organization into this um, booklet that they've produced and really it just kind of you know it brings together what we found in the systematic review but it's also saying there's kind of not one type of green space or one type of forest that is beneficial to health and well-being uh, particularly mental health um, that there are important things that we need to take into consideration. So variety is important. We've found that from a lot of our studies at Forest Research, that, you know, people are looking for variety uh, in the types of spaces that they're visiting. And that also depends on the size of that space. But people like some trees, open views. They like water. They like a variety of footpaths, etc. But also um, the quality of that space is important. Um, so is it managed well? Is it maintained well? Do people feel welcome? Do they see people like themselves using that space? Um, those things are important. Biodiversity and the level of biodiversity. So that can be actual biodiversity, but also how people perceive whether this is a biodiverse space is important. And also the context is really important. So, you know, what type of space is it? Um, in what type of context and understanding that as well as the kind of residents um, who live around that space and people who might be using it is also really important uh, so that things can be created that are beneficial but also be adapted potentially as kind of um, people's needs and wants change but also accessibility is important is the, again is this a place that people can easily access is it close to people's, where people live? And how proximate is it to people? So um, that booklet is now available. And again, that, the link to that can be provided. 
So that's just the kind of overview, really, of kind of health and well-being benefits. I'm thinking a bit about the characteristics um, of green spaces and forests. Uh, the next few slides, I'd like to touch on um, greening in a couple of different um, settings. So the first one I'd like to touch on is about um, greening um, in the National Health Service in the UK. So primarily focused on hospitals at the moment. Um, and this NHS green space um, is really a project, a programme um, focused on Scotland, uh, organised by the Green Exercise Partnership. Um, and they've been working with the NHS to green hospital grounds, some of which already have uh, a certain amount of greenery. Um, and they've taken a kind of three stage approach to this. So it's about you know, understanding what green space is already there potentially. It might be about improving that. It might be about some new planting. It could be about developing something specific for that hospital, whether that's a growing space or a sensory garden or a wildflower meadow. And then putting in pathways, maybe some seating, a place where people can have a view. And then with those infrastructure changes in place, uh, then um, you can promote what they're doing. So they've created leaflets and posters, case studies of demonstration projects in different hospitals across Scotland. And then the third element has been a project officer has been associated with some of the demonstration projects. And this is really allowing, you know, being the link really between the space and NHS staff in the hospital, uh, the patients, uh, the visitors and also getting support from volunteers. Um, so that quite a lot has been done across different um, healthcare settings in Scotland. Um, in Forest Research, we got involved in um, carrying out some interviews with NHS staff and also with some of the uh, project officers, just talking about some of the, how things were going, how they were developing uh, the project, who, how people were using it, uh, what were the barriers for staff in actually getting out of the hospital on their own or with patients. Um, that's not an easy task. Um, but I think, you know, from those interviews and also with some of the senior NHS staff uh, within Scotland, um, that sort of green, focus on greening hospital grounds has become much more part of the kind of conversation and part of their decision-making process. And they're thinking much more about including green space into kind of new build and also retrofitting it into existing hospitals. So the other kind of green setting I wanted to mention was school grounds. So many of you might have heard of Forest School in which children are taken out to a forest environment to carry out their learning, whatever that might be in that setting and it allows for you know a whole different way of learning and also physical activity but it can be quite difficult so a lot of forest school is focused on young children where it's a bit easier to get them out of the classroom whereas it seems to be uh, harder for older children who are focusing on exams so there is the opportunity of greening school grounds um, and I just wanted to mention this systematic review of a whole range of experimental studies, uh, looking at some of the impacts on children, so of greening their school grounds, so kind of creating a better appreciation of them, but also sometimes having an impact on their retention. So when they're focused in the classroom, that's quite hard work. Getting out into a greener environment can help to restore that attention. And also, you know, it can be used to improve physical activity. So there are, are projects and greening of school grounds that have created, you know, um, you know, a whole range of things that children can move over, under, et cetera, um, and engage with in different ways. And it could also have an impact on pro-social behaviours. And there's been some beneficial effects in terms of socio-emotional health outcomes. So, you know, that seems to be, you know, a good opportunity to think about greening uh, places where we children spend a lot of time and helping to reduce some of those equity gaps, health equity gaps, by improving their physical and mental well-being. 
So now I'd like to kind of move on to talk a bit about COVID and engagement with green space during the pandemic. Um, and this is some work um, we got involved in forest research with some of the other arms length bodies in the UK, so Nature Scotland, uh, the Environment Agency, Natural Resources Wales and Natural England. And we kind of pulled together our different kind of surveys and pieces of work that we were doing last year. And what we found is quite a polarised picture. Um, so about, you know, over a third of people were accessing and benefiting from green space more than usual. Less than a third, it was about the same. And over a third of people were accessing and benefiting a lot less. So, yeah, quite a division. And a survey that we're doing this year seems to be showing similar at the moment. But also for children, there was an impact. So um, a survey in England found that six in 10 children were spending less time outdoors since the start of COVID. Uh, when we looked at the different types of green spaces that people were visiting, then urban green spaces were the most frequently visited and walking was the most popular activity. Um, but you can think um, that there's a whole range of kind of reasons behind this that are going on about why people can visit nature more because they had some more time potentially, or why people might be visiting less. The work that we did in forest research, um, that was a survey of over 2000 people. And we had some physical activity questions in there because we're doing some work at the moment on physical activity and green space. Um, and what we found from the survey was that those people who are meeting the kind of recommended levels of physical activity a week, so that's 150 minutes, were more likely to kind of maintain their overall well-being, but they also reported feeling increased connection to the natural environment. Um, and they were motivated to, move, to visit for physical activity, but not only for that, they also wanted to explore, they wanted to connect with nature, and also they wanted to learn. So we've kind of published that in a recent paper that's come out this year. But in the survey, we were also asking about those kind of feelings of connection to nature. So were people taking more time to appreciate nature? Were they feeling happier in nature? Had that changed for the better or worse? Uh, were they feeling connected to nature? And over two thirds of the respondents to the survey um, for all three questions reported an increase, whether that was significant or some increase in those feelings across the three questions but um, there was a statistically significant increase in people saying that they were taking more time to appreciate nature. So you can think back to our first lockdown where not much else was happening. You were allowed outdoors for an hour a day um, and people talked much more about noticing bird sound, quieter, you know, there was less traffic on the roads. So they were really kind of thinking much more about nature. It's quite a lot in the media as well. Um, and also um, we found in the survey that women were significantly more likely to report an increased connection to nature than men. And we also asked about their connection to trees and woodlands. Uh, we knew not everyone would have a connection to a wood or forest nearby to them. So we wanted to ask about trees and woods in different contexts, you know, in your garden, along the street. Uh, along footpaths. And again, there was quite a lot of increase, uh, more than 50% of people recorded, um, reported an increase across all of these. Um, but those in urban locations uh, were more likely to appreciate trees in their local parks um, than rural respondents. And again, women were more likely to appreciate trees and woodlands than men were. And we also touched on the benefits of that, you know, of visiting kind of green space and forests uh, and whether there'd been any sort of change for the better or change for the worse in some of the benefits. Um, so the top benefit uh, was about feeling of escape and freedom, uh, but also mental well-being. There was increases in that people saying that had changed for the better in terms of the benefits they were gaining enjoying their activity with people in their household when you couldn't mix with other households and also gaining a sense of solace when engaging with nature. Um, and interestingly, younger people uh, reported, you know, a more of a range of benefits than um, older participants in the survey. 
And again, females were more likely to report positive change in benefits than the males. Um, but overall, out of the 10 benefits listed for eight of those, um, there was a change for the better for more than 50% of the respondents to the survey, so quite a considerable number. We did carry out some interviews. So when we uh, uh, completed the survey, we did ask um, a small subsample of 25 people if they would be willing to be interviewed. And we had a mix of people from urban and rural locations. Um, and these are just a few of the quotes from that. Um, really focused on kind of families and with children, um, accessing green spaces and woodlands, um, for people who were getting that sort of chance to get outside rather than people who couldn't because they were vulnerable or they were shielding or they were worried about going outdoors. Um, so thinking back to last year when a lot of people were homeschooling their children, um, which took, you know, a lot of effort for parents. Um, and, you know, there could still be the opportunity sort of later in the afternoon to get out and enjoy um, contact with the natural environment, so just getting out children out into the fresh air, doing something physically active. But you can see from these quotes that people are also using it as a learning opportunity um, and really, you know, looking into, you know, how they could learn more about flora and fauna, doing nature hunts, tree rubbing, mini beast hunts. So um, really kind of making the most of that opportunity. Uh, some of you know, the people in the interviews also talked about when things started to open up, they would then maybe not have as much contact with nature and green spaces because there would be other things for them to do. But at this time, there was little else and little, little other opportunity. So um, I'm coming to the end of the talk, and I just wanted to touch on this idea of partnerships and collaborations um, and policies and to think about kind of cross sections of solutions that allow for and support time in forest and nature for everybody. So we often talk about kind of sectors needing to kind of work together. And there are examples of this. I'm sure you can think of examples yourselves. So, you know, things like the health sector, working with the environment sector and voluntary sectors on things like green prescribing, social prescriptions, uh, the sports sector, working with the environment sector to encourage physical activity outdoors. The education sector, working with the environment sector on things like forest school. Um, and there's a whole range of examples. Um, and our Human Health and Sustainable Forest Management uh, publication has some case studies from different European countries. If you wanted to look at those, so for example, in Austria, there's a tourism body in Salzburg working with a university hospital and a spa centre to create health tourism. In Scotland, there's a project being led by Scottish Forestry with partnership with the NHS called Branching Out, and that's working with people um, in mental health services who are um, you know, often on medication or having therapy uh, and offering kind of forest-based creative and conservation activities. Um, in Germany, there's something called Dr. Forest. Um, in Bavaria, offering kind of pedagogic annual events related to the topic of forests and health. So all of these are about kind of, you know, making that sort of much more widely known. So lots of good examples, but I guess scaling up is important. Um, and that sort of importance of connection to and engagement with and caring for green spaces is really critical when we think about kind of green recovery post COVID, we need to think about policies that allow for time outdoors, that support delivery of health benefits, and that focus on opportunities kind of near to where people live. And that sort of the whole agenda is developing. Some of these things are not new, they've been talked about for a long time, but they're kind of growing in size. Um, and the whole thing around inequalities have been highlighted by COVID. So that kind of focus on access for all is really important. We know this has been an issue for quite a long time. Um, but linked to that is also the kind of importance of proximity to nature. So when we were in various lockdowns and we had to access places near to where we lived, um, that was easy for some people, much less easy for others in urban areas that could be really crowded 
where people felt maybe less comfortable because there wasn't enough um, space to social distance in the green spaces or even on the pavements and roads. There's a really big push at the moment on kind of social prescribing and green prescriptions. Um, in England, for example, there's a thousand social prescribing link workers that are joining uh, people um, going to the health uh, service and a whole range of different organisations that can provide opportunities that can be green setting opportunities, it can be music related, art related, but there's um, a lot of work happening in this area. And then there's things like the NHS Green Space, NHS Forest. There's also um, networks and designations. So Biophilic Cities uh, is a network of cities across the world thinking about how they bring nature more into the city. Uh, Birmingham is one of those. And then in the UK, there's also really strong focus at the moment on increasing tree cover. And that's trees in kind of all settings. So that might be increasing woodlands, expanding existing woodlands. It can be trees uh, in the urban area in all contexts, you know, in the street, for example. Uh, and the importance of that potentially, um, obviously, there's a strong focus on kind of net zero uh, and carbon sequestration. But also there's an opportunity to think about how some of that tree cover and treescapes can be targeted at areas to improve people's health, health and well-being and also to connect people to nature. So I'm going to end it there. Thanks very much for listening. If you want to find out a bit more about what we do at Forest Research and in the group, then do visit our website um, or do follow us on Twitter. And thanks a lot for listening. Brilliant. Thank you, Liz. And yeah, I'm glad you mentioned forest research there, because as, as with last week, some people asking questions or in the chat about forestry England, different, different things. So Liz and Joe might not be able to answer questions about forestry England. They may well be able to, but don't assume they can. So Liz, brilliant. Thank you very much. Keep your questions and your, your chat and everything going on, folks. But we will right now go straight over to Joe. Over to you, Joe. Thanks, John. Now, I just must let everyone know I am going to have to turn my camera off just because I've learnt over the last 18 months of teaching on Zoom that sadly, once I load my PowerPoint presentation, my internet stability is significantly affected. So to make sure you can continue to hear me, I'm going to turn my camera off and then I will share my screen and load the presentation. OK, so I'm assuming and perhaps John can hear me and see my slides. That's great to know. Thank you. OK, so my name's Jo Barton. I'm based at the School of Sport, Rehabilitation and Exercise Science at the University of Essex. I'm actually a sports scientist, uh, but my research focuses on the health and social benefits of participating in what we call green exercise. I know Liz did use that term, but it's an umbrella term that incorporates all sorts of activities that you do outdoors in green spaces. So I lead up a green exercise research team, um, been working in this area, oh gosh, 18 years now, so quite a long time. Um, and this evening, I'm going to present one of my PhD students, Emma Burrows, some of her recent work that looks into the perceived links between biodiversity and well-being. Um, clearly, I co-supervise this student with an environmental microbiologist because of my background in physical activity and health, but it's really been fascinating from my perspective because I've been learning a lot about the role of biodiversity in mediating this relationship between health and well-being, but sorry, between nature and health. So we've heard quite a lot from Liz, um, which has set this all up very nicely about how having regular contact with nature is good for our health. Um, now, Liz did also touch on the fact that it uh, increased, if you have increased accessibility, proximity and quantity of nature, then that significantly enhances our physical, mental, social health and well-being. Uh, Liz also touched on the fact that there's evidence that nature appears to be uh, an effective antidote for stress, which I'm sure a lot of us can relate to. So, Touching on just a couple of examples of this evidence, looking at uh, quantity and proximity of local green space and how that's important for our health. This figure on the slide 
um, is basically showing you the differences according to whether you're one of the higher income earners. Uh, the yellow bar is the middle income lower, uh, middle income earner, and the green bar is the lowest income earners. And what it's looking at is how much access you have to green space within your local vicinity and how that relates to mortality rates. So obviously we know that unfortunately um, those with the lowest income do have the highest mortality rates compared to those with higher incomes. But what's interesting here is that you can see on the far left of the slide, it's looking at the differences when you have no green space in your local vicinity. Whereas on the very right hand of the screen, it's comparing those rates when you have access to very green areas. So this data is taken from England, and what it's showing you is that those that live nearest to uh, very green spaces have a 25% lower all-cause mortality rate compared to those people who live in areas with very low concentrations of green space. So what it's suggesting is that individuals who are exposed to the greenest environments have the lowest levels of health inequality related to income. We know that having access to nearby nature also influences our behaviours. And, and as Liz touched on this, especially in relation to physical activity and how frequently we visit those spaces and the amount of time we spend there. So the figure on the slide shows the odds ratios of achieving those physical activity guidelines, which Liz told you was 150 minutes per week, um, by your visit frequency to local green space. And what it shows is that the odds of achieving those recommended uh, amounts of physical activity are about over four times greater for people who visit their local green space once a week compared to never going. Some of the other research that looks at how long you spend in green spaces has found that those that spend two hours a week in green spaces, and that could be your local park, your local woodlands, or a bigger forest or wilderness area, and that could be either all at once or spaced over several visits. If you spend two hours a week, you are significantly more likely to report good health and psychological well-being than those who don't. But as Liz also touched on, so we're clearly in sync here, this research does remain fairly broad. So it lacks that understanding of what specific qualities of nature, such as biodiversity, and how they can affect and contribute to that relationship, that really isn't fully understood because as Liz alluded to, the detail is not often reported. So um, before I talk about the importance of biodiversity in potentially mediating this relationship between nature and health, it's probably just important that we are all clear on what we're defining as biodiversity. So it refers to the diversity of genetics, but also species and ecosystems that are present in any particular given area. So the study that I'm gonna to talk to you about focuses on people's perceptions of nature and biodiversity that they can actually encounter and interact with. So clearly we're only gonna focus on species and ecosystems diversity. The species diversity is defined as the variety of species that are found within a region. And you can see from the slide, it consists of both species richness, which is basically the number of different species, but also the relative abundance of each of those species that are present. So really looking at species evenness. Ecosystem diversity is defined as the diversity of habitats, ecosystems, and the accompanying ecological processes that maintain them. And to touch on some of the, the background research that informed this study, uh, there was four systematic reviews that assessed how biodiversity affects human health and well-being, and they produced quite inconclusive results. Some of those studies found biodiversity to be positively related to well-being, whereas there was an equal amount that actually found no support. And I think what compounds the issue is that biodiversity was often poorly defined and sometimes measured indirectly. So using proxies for biodiversity, such as wildlife richness or flora and fauna. 
There is also some evidence to suggest that an increase in plant species diversity enhances the aesthetic value of a green space. However, there's a lot of questions about how and which aspects of biodiversity that may or may not contribute to this positive effect of nature on health still remain relatively unanswered. There's also a lack of qualitative uh, studies and sort of participant narrative that helps us understand, most importantly, how and why biodiversity could positively influence health. There's also a large bias uh, in the research to date, as it involves mainly countries um, such as Western societies and upper income countries, for example, Great Britain, Netherlands, Scandinavian countries. Uh, most of those are featured in the research, but lower and middle income European countries in particular, such as the Balkan countries of Southeastern Europe, have been relatively neglected. So this is quite important because the relationship between biodiversity and well-being is going to vary between countries that are in different geographical locations due to those differences in biodiversity, such as species richness, the evenness, composition, um, as well as exhibiting variations in climate, um, in levels of development and income, and of course, those cultural differences, which probably affect the way that people value and interact with nature and biodiversity. So Bulgaria and Great Britain are quite good examples of countries that exhibit those sorts of differences, and that's why we chose them as the focus of this study. And what we were primarily interested in doing was starting to try and address some of this imbalance in the existing research and conduct some in-depth qualitative interviews to really try and explore British and Bulgarian thoughts and feelings towards nature and biodiversity and how they perceive that to relate to their well-being. So we may have some attendees here today, actually, the living in Bulgaria, uh, but it's an Eastern European Balkan country, 111,000 kilometers squared, located in Southeast Europe. And although it's classed as a upper middle income country on the global stage, within Europe, it's still relatively underdeveloped and has some of the highest levels of poverty, of income inequality and social exclusion and also some of the lowest living standards within Europe. So in contrast, Britain is classed as an upper income country with the 10th highest European living standards. So there's some clear differences between the two. So these two countries also differ uh, in terms of their biodiversity. So as you can see from the table, despite being a much smaller country, Bulgaria actually possesses high levels of biodiversity in terms of species and ecosystem diversity, um, supporting over 3,900 different species of vascular plants, um, 170 which are endemic to Bulgaria, 95 different species of terrestrial animals, 420 of birds, 36 of reptiles, 17 of amphibians and 216 different species of butterflies. In comparison, as you can see from the table, Britain possesses 2,412 different species of vascular plants and a lower number of all other species with the exception of birds. So although at first glance it might appear that Britain has a higher species richness of birds than Bulgaria, it's important to take into account country size. So Bulgaria, as we've said, is much smaller, actually has the greatest levels of bird species richness within Europe when accounting for country size. Okay, so moving on to, to what we did, we recruited participants using what is called, it's a very long term here, an exponential discriminative snowball sampling technique that's often used in these sorts of qualitative studies. Basically, what that means is participants offer the names of other potential suitable participants. Um, and then as researchers, we would approach them if they offered something to our samples diversity in terms of 
age, gender, and living, se uh, living setting, then we would obviously contact those recommendations. But what we might do is not follow up some of the recommend participants if it turned out that they were biodiversity experts. That's not what we're interested in. We want the views from the general population or perhaps those with demographic characteristics that are already really well represented in our sample. So it's really happening and evolving by word of mouth here. It's important that we reassure participants that they didn't need to have any knowledge of biodiversity or nature to participate in the study. And we also wanted to make it clear that there was no right or wrong answers to the interview questions, as we really wanted to find out how they personally thought and felt about nature and biodiversity and how, if at all, I guess, that they believed nature and biodiversity to impact upon their well-being. So just to give you uh, some overview of the participant demographics, uh, we interviewed 25 participants, including 14 British and 11 Bulgarians, relatively even split in terms of gender and ages. Um, Sorry, the ages range from, I think it was 22 to 75 British participants, 20 to 51 for Bulgarian participants. As you can see from the mean ages, uh, British participants were slightly higher at 38.4 compared to Bulgarians at 29.4. Sample size was also representative in terms of living environment. So a range of participants living in rural, suburban and urban areas. Um, online interviews were, so enabled us, I guess, to engage British participants from a range of different counties in East Anglia, South East, South West and the Midlands. Most of the Bulgarian participants were from a town called Karlova, and the surrounding villages and Klovdov city, as well as the capital city, Sofia. So the participants took part in one-to-one -one semi-structured interviews via Skype, Zoom, or Viber with a translator, if required. Um, questions from a pre-planned interview guide covered important topics about how people think and feel about nature and biodiversity and how they think that relates to their well-being. We also used more probing questions to explore the research topic in more depth and sort of just regular prompts such as, you know, could you describe that in more detail? What we also did is the interviewers would regularly summarise what the participants had said, just to make sure they were interpreting their responses correctly. And by using that combination of approaches really helps to aid data elicitation, ensures that we're interpreting the data accurately and helps to facilitate that rapport building between the interviewer and the participant. So the interviews started with very sort of broad, open-ended questions concerning health and well-being and nature without actually mentioning the word biodiversity, just to allow the possibility that participants may well bring that up of their own accord. Once those questions had finished, um, we then went to, to talk to them about uh, the, the definition of biodiversity so that they all were then understanding what the term meant and receiving the same information. Then we went on to ask questions specifically relating to biodiversity. Once we'd asked them all of the questions, uh, we then uh, gave them two standardized questionnaires to complete. So the Nature Connection Index and the Office for National Statistics for Personal Wellbeing Questions because this gives us sort of a quantitative assessment of their perceived personal well-being and nature connection. So the interviews, including the completion of those two questionnaires, varied from 50 to 130 minutes in length, and the average duration was about 76 minutes. And obviously all the interviews were audio recorded and transcribed verbatim. Then once we got all the data, we um, underwent some inductive thematic analysis, uh, which is really appropriate because it's explorative, not confirmatory. Um, so it allows the analysis to be directed by the data itself and not perhaps by any preconceived ideas that the researcher may have going into this. So the results tend to then be more detailed in terms of their analysis. 
and involving the whole data set and minimises any risks of missing relevant information and misinterpreting data to fit with your prior expectations. So we did use um, Braun and Clark's definition of a theme um, as something that captures important, relevant information and represents patterns in the data to determine what would come out as one of the key themes. So for contextual purposes, I thought I'd share with you um, the scores from the wellbeing questions and the nature connectedness scale. Um, so you can see how they vary between Bulgarian and British participants. So the top three rows here are the scores for life satisfaction, worthwhile and happiness. And you can see from the mean scores here, there's not a lot of variation between British and Bulgarian participants. And they were all categorised as high. So if you had a score between seven to eight, that is categorised as having high well-being in those domains. The anxiety score, which is the fourth row on the table. So Bulgarians actually scored lower, slightly lower for anxiety. They actually fall within the low range, which is two to three, whereas British participants scored 3.8 compared to the 3.4. Not a lot of difference, but just creeping more towards that medium category of four to five. The nature connection index. Um, it's interesting that Bulgarians came out as more connected to nature than British participants. So you can see from the footnotes on this table that scores could range from 0 to 100, with 100 being the maximum score that you could get for nature connection. So Bulgarians scoring near 72 compared to British participants at 60.5. So they were clearly felt more connected. And if you look at the standard deviations, also there's a lot more spread in the British scores than perhaps the Bulgarians. So analysis of the interviews produced many key themes. I'm just going to briefly talk you through some of them. Um, and they've got supporting quotes that illustrate those themes on the slides. What was quite interesting that the results were representative of both nationalities. And the key things that were emerging were coming from both countries. So therefore, there's no reason to separate and compare them because actually they were both generating the, the same themes. The general broad findings were that people consistently preferred highly biodiverse environments in terms of both ecosystem and species diversity compared to more moderate to low biodiverse environments and built up areas, built up urban areas, I should say. And biodiversity as a whole, rather than the diversity of sort of specific taxa or aspects, so rather than specifically colour or shape, um, that was valued, but it was biodiversity as a whole that was perceived to be most important to well-being. People did perceive different aspects of biodiversity, such as the variety of trees, variety of birds and insects, and the resulting variety in colour, shapes and animal behaviours really to be inseparable in terms of their contribution to the whole experience of natural environments and how that impacts on their well-being. So, for example, increased biodiversity, you can see on, on the theme on the slide, increased biodiversity increased that sense of balance and interconnectedness in the environment. I think people described it as everything working together in perfect harmony. And that was what evoked those feelings of peace, belonging and nature connectedness. Increased biodiversity also raised the unpredictability and created that sort of sense of mystery and spontaneity of the environment, which then made people want to explore it and interact with it. Um, and the variety of experiences, both within and across different visits to the same place, made them feel as if there's sort of a greater chance to experience something new or something familiar, but in a novel way. And those sorts of interactions are what elicited these feelings of curiosity, interest, engagement, and exploration of nature, as well as vitality. Perceived wildness and biodiversity were also highly positively associated 
So they tended to bring about shared well-being benefits, such as this feelings of awe, freedom, sense of belonging. So biodiversity increases the sensations of being immersed in life and a part, I guess, of something bigger. That's what they saw it as. And that part feeling of being part of something bigger was what was generating those um, feelings of gratitude. So the biodiverse settings, I guess, signal like a flourishing environment that's full of life. And that is what increases the authenticity, the beauty and the sense of escapism that you experience in those sorts of environments. Um, although strongly related, people do think of biodiversity and wildness, though, when you talk to them as sort of distinct concepts, generally preferring highly biodiverse, less wild environments to low biodiverse, highly wild environments. I think that's because biodiversity increases that sense of life of the environment and offers that continued unpredictable change. So interestingly, increased biodiversity and not wildness uniquely increase this sense of life in the environment and that feeling of nature connectedness and vitality. And biodiversity's ability to maintain people's attention to their current environment and being in that present moment is what led to those pleasant states of calm, of peace, of contemplation and mindfulness and really just a time to stop be still and feel connected. And that is what contributed to a sense of vitality and joy. Um, increased biodiversity makes people feel more alive, more energized, connected to life, nature, the wider world. And as I've said before, part of something bigger than just themselves. And that really helps them in perspective taking and makes everyday life problems seem a lot smaller. It heightens that sense of being away from everyday life and feeling more refreshed and alive. Um, and as Liz alluded to in some of the other research, really providing restoration from everyday stresses. Increased biodiversity also increased the season variation and the richness experienced in those different seasons by increasing those cycle changes in nature that you see in terms of daily, seasonal and life cycles. And that results in continued interesting variety and novelty of experiences, but through constant familiar changes. And that allows these sort of simultaneous experiences of interest, engagement, but also comfort, reassurance, and that continued sense of renewal and optimism, but also experiencing excitement, vitality and awe. And the last theme that I'll touch on um, is about how increased biodiversity not only increases positive emotion, but more importantly, the variety and the intensity of those positive emotions that were experienced. The increased variety of animal behaviours is quite a good example of that. Um, but in addition, I think the multi-sensory nature experience maximises those wellbeing benefits with that natural sound diversity. And what came out really strongly was the importance of bird sound. And, and that was crucial to contributing to well-being. So those sort of non-visual auditory experiences are really important, as much so as the diversity of visual experiences. And people preferred both an abundance and a variety of bird song. So clearly, I thought you'd be quite interested in what came out um, from, from some of the interviews about the role of trees in particular uh, in the settings. And forests generally came out as one of the most common natural environment that was perceived as being highly diverse. So that, that was really important. Um, and what uh, the participants were saying was it was the presence and the variety of trees that were particularly appreciated for their ability to support a variety of insects, birds uh, and mammal species and that that helped to improve the aesthetics and boost the sort of perceived beauty of the area. They also enjoyed them due to changing colours as deciduous trees lose and gain their leaves 
And what also came out was the, the, the importance of having mature trees present. So the mature trees had a unique benefit of inducing a sense of feeling connected to both past and future generations. Um, as people are able to interact with and experience the same tree, despite themselves perhaps being alive at different times. So getting towards the end of my presentation now. Um, so what can we conclude? What sort of the take home messages? So we already know that nature improves wellbeing, but it seems from this research that more biodiverse environments have a much bigger impact. Biodiversity uniquely increases vitality and connectedness and perhaps acts as sort of a key mediator of facilitating nature connection. Perceived biodiversity seems to be actually more important than measured actual objective biodiversity in terms of enhancing individuals' well-being. And qualities such as perceived tree diversity and bird soil are particularly important. So I think biodiversity improves well-being by fostering this exploration of the natural environment, which then increases feelings of relaxation, engagement, connection with life, vitality, and all of that enhances well-being. So I think the exploratory study has started to help us unravel the process by which biodiversity affects mental health and well-being, but there still needs to be a lot more interdisciplinary research to be conducted to fully understand the relationship between biodiversity and health so that we can enable um, landscape planners, practitioners, policy makers to really make much more informed decisions. Thank you ever so much for listening. As Liz did at the end of hers as well, there's um, signposted here to website, which I think Sophie's very kindly shared in the chat, uh, my contact details and um, also Twitter. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, Joe. Absolutely. Great stuff. Thank you, Joe. Um, and thank you for putting your email there, address there as well. We've had a couple of people asking if they can maybe have copies of the presentations afterwards. So if um, if anyone managed to get down Joe or Liz's email addresses, then it looks like you're free to email them. Otherwise, please email me, uh, john at trees.org.uk, and we'll make sure it gets to them. Okay, questions. We've got lots of questions. As ever, I don't bother trying to arrange them properly. And then I realise, as our second speaker's finished, that I'm totally unprepared. But that's fine. Nobody's noticed so far. <laughs> um, right. Let's go with a question for Liz uh, that I've lost. Here it is. Right. It's a question from Ian. It's kind of starting off with a slightly negative question, possibly. But... Um, Obviously, it's great news that lots of people are interested in green spaces more during the COVID pandemic, and it's fantastic that it was obviously of such benefit to people. But we did find that I've heard quite a few sort of reports of with all this increased usage of the green spaces, there's potentially more damage to them. There's potentially more people who perhaps aren't quite aware of how you're supposed to treat things, I guess, or they're not looking after them properly. And Ian said about some green spaces have suffered negative impacts from increased use, such as littering, dirty camping, damage to trees. What research is being done into strategies to counter these negatives? Is it a case of education or responsible behaviour or resourcing the management of these areas to cope with greater use? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question, Ian. Thanks for that. I think there's a number of things going on, aren't there? Um, you know, the pandemic is something that we've kind of never faced um, in our generation before. And so in some ways, with the sort of strict restrictions that we faced, sometimes you know, the whole kind of social norms changed. And that also impacted on what people could do when things started to kind of be less restrictive. Um, we also found that, yeah, there was a lot of people visiting kind of green spaces, nature spaces that weren't as used to accessing those spaces because there was not literally not much else to do. So, again, that is part of kind of, you know, learning and education. And you can think about it in a whole range of ways. You know, do we engage children with nature from an early age so that they respect places, that they think about more about how you care for places? Um, can we kind of frame messages differently? I think there's some work going on on the kind of countryside code at the moment. Um, 
but also thinking about, um, you know, that are there enough of these spaces at the moment? So we, there was a huge demand um, and the demand was for local spaces near to where we people lived and people live primarily in urban areas. Um, so as we're thinking about, you know, more kind of particularly kind of treescape creation, uh, then some of those kind of treescapes should be near to where populations can easily access them. So I think, you know, there will be ongoing research related to, um, you know, what's been happening with green spaces and how people can engage with them and connect with them as COVID progresses. Uh, and as the kind of more restrictions come and go, I think there's a, been a recent conference in Norway where they're talking about setting up a sort of international a group of people to kind of look at this from different countries' perspectives and to see what we can learn across different countries. So I think, you know, it is a real kind of conundrum and it's been quite horrible for people to see, you know, some of that littering and abuse of green spaces uh, at times when people need the most. Thanks very much, Liz. I think it'd be interesting if um, we've got people watching from all over the world. I'm not sure if this is something common to across the world. I'm guessing it's not just Britain. Sometimes we like to think that it's just us who go vandalising things, but I'm sure it's the same everywhere. So if anyone's got any uh, uh, feedback from their part of the world, then please let us know. Um, Joe, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on, on that or if that's something you've encountered in your work. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not directly as directly involved from the, the university perspective, but as a, as a university education institution, I do think clearly education will play a role. Um, and it's, it's, it's getting that joined up thinking between different partners in different sectors to be all putting out that same message. Um, and I, I think, you know, it is really important that we learn to respect our local green spaces and, and protect it for future generations. So, yes, a, a question I've heard asked number of times um, as, as good, good and bad, good that people are accessing the spaces and using them, but detrimental if it's having a ne negative impact on the environment. So there's definitely a balance to be made. <coughs> Thanks, Joe. I think I was also, um, I think it was Ted Green I was talking to about this a while ago, who was saying that the uh, in Windsor Great Park, there's now, with so many more people going, um, there's routes are being used and footpaths are being used that maybe normally have one or two people walking along them a year that now have hundreds. So they now need more inspections and it's the additional resources required on people doing tree inspections and tree maintenance and dead wood and trees that you can normally leave there fine because no one goes near it. It's suddenly actually a high target area. So interesting, uh, interesting implications. Um, brilliant. Thank you both. Uh, a question for Joe from Paul. Um, Paul says, hi, Joe. Was there much analysis of black, Asian and minority ethnic communities' perceptions of access to nature and green spaces? The truth is, sadly not, no, uh, which is a, unfortunately a, a constant pattern in a lot of this research um, and something that absolutely needs to be addressed and, and looked into um, because from the very small amount of research that I'm aware of, um, a, a big issue sometimes for the BAME communities is perceived access. So they might have actual access to green spaces on their doorsteps, but they don't perceive them to be a place that they would go. Um, and there's quite a prolific study in Sheffield that was done on this. So it's about uh, understanding why and, and overcoming those barriers that's stopping certain people accessing those sorts of green spaces. So I would love to have said, yes, my whole sample involved representation for Bay communities, but if I'm honest, it, it didn't, no. Good question. Thanks, Joe. Well, I'm gonna I'll ask a similar question to Liz, um, question from uh, Naomi. Um, Naomi's asking, uh, I would imagine that in the UK, as in the rest of the Western world, communities of colour, as well as disenfranchised communities in a lower economic level, do not have the resources with which to access a forested environment. How is this being addressed in order to increase well-being equality? So similar question, but not exactly the same. But Liz, have you got any thoughts from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, thanks very much. And hi, Naomi. Um, nice to see you on the call. Um, so, um, yeah, this is, again, it's kind of really difficult one, isn't it? Um, I think um, there is kind of, there are interventions that are taking place and being kind of tried and tested, but it's kind of scaling that up. So 
the national parks in England had a focus on the black and Asian ethnic minority groups where they took people out into to our kind of, you know, our fantastic national parks. Um, and that was a kind of ongoing project. Um, there are kind of more walking groups being set up by now by people from um, these communities. Um, there are sometimes, you know, focused on deprived communities and getting them out into the coast um, and into, yeah, sort of forests or green spaces. But I guess my concern is that it's, um, they're often kind of, projects and interventions that are time bound. So all this nice activity happens, you know, people get out um, and have a good time, uh, get to know some places that they didn't know before. And that can be, you know, that is fantastic. And they might be able to go back there under their own steam. But that is an assumption that a lot of projects think that people will then just be able to do it themselves. So sometimes it's about setting up these kind of groups that then can can then can continue some of this activity. I remember going out with a Asian women's group in the National Forest in England and to a bit of the forest that they never kind of thought of accessing. And we took them round with some of their children to see, you know, what they could do, the kind of play spaces, um, you know, and they said, you know, they'd have to come back as a group and it would be really good to kind of talk to some of the men's groups and they think about bringing their families out so it is about yeah, understanding those communities and going to them and sometimes facilitating that access. But I think we need to think more about the long term. So these interventions, you know, how long they last and how can they be more sustainable? Absolutely. Thank you. It's definitely part of a much bigger uh, issue and problem, isn't it? But it's certainly uh, something important for us all to be considering. Um, Okay, let's jump around a bit. And uh, Joe, in your presentation, you said something about the uh, the importance of mature trees and the fact that mature trees are disproportionately important in, in the benefits and everything. And I was pleased to hear you say that. And uh, there was, we're often talking about, it's not just about planting, it's about establishing those trees and getting them through to maturity. And Paul asked a question uh, saying that unfortunately some local authorities have quite a poor quality of aftercare for trees uh, after they've been planted and that this could be a hurdle that a lot of the efforts to green places up for mental health benefits could fall short. Um, how do we go about using this evidence and using the research, this is a question for both of you really, but to convince local authorities, to convince tree managers and landowners that they need to be investing in these trees, looking after these trees if they're going to get through to maturity and then deliver these benefits? What, what do we have to do to get to that stage? Joel, I'll ask you first. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, as both Liz and I touched on our research, a lot of the evidence to, bear, to date really doesn't draw down as to what's most important in the landscape in improving well-being. Um, and I think, so, you know, if I, Liz will have a just different perspective working at Forest Research, but, um, you know, if there's more evidence that's specifically focuses on trees and it's of a rigorous level that we can then convince the decision makers and those that hold the purse strings at local authority levels um, that this is the value that you get from managing your trees um, both in terms of looking after the more mature trees but also investing in, in new future tree planting looking forwards um, you know we from an academic perspective working at the university we spend our lives trying to um, convey the wider impact outside of academia and engage in conversations with funders um, to take on board the evidence to inform their decision making. And it's a hard slog, I'm not going to lie. Um, so it's, it's, I guess it's understanding what evidence they require um, to be convinced by. To, to, to make those decisions and, and actually help get them to inform some of the research designs we do at an academic level to make sure we can provide that evidence that's going to help make those positive decisions. So again, it comes back to working in collaboration, I think, and, and sharing the informa information that we're, we're generating. Thanks, Joe. Liz, you're not in. Have you got any thoughts to add to that? I mean, I guess, you know, it's it's trying to kind of change that mindset, isn't it? From not some seeing trees as a kind of liability to seeing trees as a kind of benefit. Um, and, you know, colleagues at Forest Research are working on iTree Eco, 
and have done a various, you know, quite a few projects across different cities across the UK where that's valuing mainly the regulating services. But we are working with them at the moment to think how we bring in some of the more kind of cultural ecosystem services. Um, so, you know, Joe touched on that, you know, what is the evidence that's required? So it's understanding kind of what's needed um, and also, you know, who the audience is. So kind of couching things in ways that the health sector will take notice of, in ways that, you know, the education sector might take notice of, for example, so that they, you know, start putting in the importance of kind of trees in urban areas into their strategies. I think those things can help. Um, but it, it, it's really difficult, isn't it? Because when you think about, you know, local authorities and all the things that they've got to do, um, you know, how important are trees within the scale of things when they think about health and social care and what can be made potentially, you know, sort of almost like a regulation of you've got to look after this tree for this period of time or to have a cohort of volunteers that are going to help to do that. Um, that could make a difference. Sometimes, you know, local authority tree officers have said, you know, regulation can be a good thing if it raises the profile of trees for me within the local authority. So that I can make the case for things when people are making the case for other things within the local authority. So, um, yeah, there's a way to go, I think. But, um, you know, the evidence is increasing and we can talk about it in many different ways, which I think is a helpful. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, you mentioned I tree Eco there. I, I'm very pleased that you're working on the cultural benefits as well, because obviously I tree Eco does many brilliant things. But one thing it's one of my bugbears has been it, it can't really quantify some of those benefits that are unquantifiable. And that doesn't mean they're any less important. We need to be careful we don't move to a position where we're only appreciating the things we can put a financial value on, because there's lots of things that trees do for us that you can't represent in pounds and pence and we need to make sure we don't forget them so good work Liz keep pushing away thank you for that you pleased me <laughs> yeah that's a perennial problem isn't it you know that that we want to monetize the benefits but it's not always possible so you know how can we integrate the monetary values with the kind of things that be, can be quantified and then the things that are qualitative in nature into something that's holistic rather than just a this is the number at the top or the monetary value at the top. That's an ongoing issue. Yeah. Yeah. So valuing trees is a, is, a, is probably a whole nother webinar. And I probably shouldn't share that one because I'll get all carried away. Um, right. So thank you, Liz. I've actually, right, I was going to have, a, that was sort of Joe's question that went to Liz. And now I've got another question for Liz. So apologies. Um, but I'm going to throw another one at you. Um, David prompted some real excitement in the chat when he asked, are there any ideas why there are significantly more benefits for women than for men in the, one of the slides that you showed. Is there any explanation for that? Um, I think there is some evidence that um, women, um, yeah, do kind of view nature differently. Um, and there could be, you know, a range of things going on there. So sometimes uh, women in some evidence kind of feel more connected to the natural environment. Um, you know, if you're got children you're thinking about you know what to do with your children then connecting with nature uh, can be really important um so that might mean that um women are you know within the forestry commission i think about the people who visit for the nation's forests apart the you know you know evenly split between men and women so there's something else i think going on it's not just about kind of use um, but is it the different ways in which women engage? Is it more about kind of thinking about caring for nature? And that makes us think about more about connection to nature. I think some of those things are going on, um, but potentially there's a bit more evidence required to kind of get under the skin of it. Thanks very much, Liz. So, yeah, there was a bit of excitement in the chat where some people were putting forward uh, ideas that aren't necessarily... Uh, the right ones, but that's a good answer. Thank you. Um, okay, what was I going to go to next? Right, yes, Joe. Another point you made in one of your slides I thought was very interesting was about uh, the people who were asked in Bulgaria uh, were, felt more connected to nature in the UK than the people who were asked in the UK. And I was just wondering why, if, if we had any idea why that was, if that, what was sort of sitting behind those statistics? Well, I, I think, if I'm honest, I think... 
So obviously this is based on a fairly small sample size, um, but uh, the landscapes that surround um, most of the participants that were involved in this study from Bulgaria, they have more easy access to real wild mountainous um, settings. And I think a lot of um, participants from Britain perhaps didn't have as ready access on their doorsteps to those more remote wildness areas. Um, so that was, that was what was coming through, that their perceptions, and that's why wildness and biodiversity were, were kind of a shared uh, perspective, is, is because they had access to, to what they perceived to be more biodiverse and wild areas, and that might be what is the underpinning reason for having a, a stronger connection. Um, equally, they might interpret nature connection differently, um, so there could be other reasons uh, for why they scored highly. Um, interesting, they're probably above sort of the, the average across uh, countries. Um, so yes, that would be our gut feeling as to why that might be. Um, but we would we probably need to extend it further to fully understand why they might appear more connected. Thanks, Joe. It's interesting. I mean, I wonder whether... I think it might, it's interesting on the side again, you had sort of um, high levels of poverty and income inequality and social exclu exclusion, which obviously are not good things. But I think also when I've been traveling around the place, there does seem to be a correlation almost with the more, maybe even you could almost say at a very crude level, the wealthier a country or a society, the less they perhaps appreciate nature up until a certain point. Like the, uh, that might be a ridiculous thing. So I don't know, it's when people start getting too obsessed about what sort of stuff they're going to buy next but there feels to me in my experience a, a very basic level of a correlation there no i think you're probably quite right to be honest um i think that is one of the the things that is coming out um the differences and, and that's why it's so important that we bridge these inequalities um to to enable people that perhaps would value these spaces more to make sure they are having the opportunity to access those um, but unfortunately, the reality probably could be that that, that is partly the case. Yeah, interesting. interesting. I should probably uh, travel around the world and check this out. So I'll, yeah, I'll, I'm sure. I think so. It's important, important research. Thank you, Joe. OK, another question for Liz. Um, another question. It's a question from Paul. This isn't all the same Paul. There's been several questions from Paul today. He's not hogging the limelight. There's more than one Paul available. And this Paul is asking, Liz, did any of the research lead people to demand more creation of nature, green and blue spaces close to them? Are they interested in creating new stuff or are they just consumers of it, Paul has asked? That's a yeah, really good question, Paul. And, you know, in our research at the moment, people are not kind of demanding more um, specifically. Um, they're kind of the work that we've been doing during kind of the pandemic is much more about people appreciating, you know, what they've got already. And I guess a lot of that was about local spaces near to where they were. So some of the interviews we did um, and also some of the qualitative comments from the survey were very much about, you know, we were not going to the places that we usually go where we'd hop in the car and go to a favourite place, but now we're actually we've got to discover what's on the doorstep. And some people who've lived in an area for quite a long time kind of discovered new footpaths, uh, new bits of green space, uh, routes across farmland that they'd kind of never been across before. And it was very much about that sort of appreciation. They did talk about overcrowding in some places. So kind of indirectly, you know, not so much that, Therefore, we need more spaces and we want to be involved in creating those spaces, but more that actually now there's nothing else for people to do uh, and there's massive desire to kind of get to the coast or get to a green space, then it's all become too busy. And therefore, we're looking at other, again, we're looking at other areas. So it does help people to explore, but it hasn't really led to that sort of, we need a lot more. So it's an interesting point and maybe something we should try and pick up on in some of our future work to kind of go on to that sort of question. And just to add to that as well, Liz, I think in some of the sort of other research we've done, um, what it is also about, I guess it is cre it's creating new, not creating more. So we have some of the studies we've been involved in evaluating. 
It's where it's getting people to recreate existing spaces to make to improve the quality um, and the, the sort of perceived biodiversity of them, rather than creating a whole new space, but just in effect upgrading existing places that perhaps have been neglected. And that kind of enables that sense of community when everyone's coming together to improve an existing site. So that also, I think, can sometimes play a role because there's going to be limited space eventually to create new, um, but it uh, could be about creating new spaces within existing ones just to improve the quality of that space. Thank you both very much. I had to laugh there, sorry Liz, when you were talking about people in the park saying, uh, they felt overcrowded. I, was, if I, I find that funny in the same way as I find it when people who are driving complain about traffic. <laughs> so it's this wonderful ability of humans to completely ignore the fact that they might be part of the problem they're complaining about. What marvellous creatures we are. Yeah, it's not me, it's someone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all of those people. It's not me. Absolutely. Um, right, what was I looking at? Ah, okay, here's a question for both of you. A question from Ian. Ian's on fire this evening, as uh, he so often is, but some great questions. Um, Ian is asking, as mental health issues are possibly underdiagnosed and mental health care services under-resourced, is it likely that we are underestimating the value of green space to mental health and well-being? particularly given the flexibility of these spaces to yield benefit to many individuals because they don't suffer the same capacity constraints as traditional medical facilities and practitioners. I think that's a really good point. It's when we talk about how green spaces can help sort of heal people, the capacity issues one I hadn't really thought of before. Joe, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. Are we, are we, are we underestimating the value of green space, even in some of the research that, that you've been doing? I mean, I think I'm a very biased perspective on this, <laughs> if I'm honest, because um, I, I, you know, I feel that the green spaces of all sorts have huge value for mental health in both preventative, which is really important, and treatment for those that are perhaps experiencing mental ill health. Um, and, and that's why we're, we're, you know, really keen to work with the health sector um, to get them on board to recognise the role that nature forests green spaces can all play in their health agenda um, also thinking that you know it's it's if you go down a, a, a perhaps i guess traditional I'm not sure if that's the right word route of, of going to a gp if you're experiencing mental ill health and you do actually go to a gp because many people don't but if you do and you walk away with a prescription for antidepressants um, they're not going to kick in immediately there's going to be potential side effects there's lots of other issues. Um, I'm not saying they don't play a role. Clearly, they do. Um, but you know, the good thing about green space, if you have access to it on your doorstep, um, is that it's it, the, the feelings and the improvements in your mental health, unless you've got really severe mental health, uh, are going to be quite quick. And there's not going to be any sort of negative side effects as such. So I think there's a really strong argument to be had. To, so that the health sector really do take on board. And I think they are, that is moving in the right direction, but for them to recognise the value that green spaces can play in the, the mental health of, of not just the UK, but, you know, worldwide, really. Um, so, yes, I completely concur that it's undervalued. Um, and I think it's got a real role to play. Thanks, Joe. Liz? Well, I guess it, it comes back to that, you know, how you value things, doesn't it? So that eternal conundrum that we face, you know, um, there are approaches to kind of valuing mental health benefits of forests, for example. And we're doing a bit of work at Forest Research at the moment, looking at um, how costs can be avoided from people taking kind of prescriptions uh, for anxiety and depression um, and um, how that can be avoided through kind of visits to kind of forests. Um, and we have in a kind of study come up with a, a value for a tree of these mental health avoided costs. Um, it is a kind of um, a new approach, I guess, and it's based on research that's been done in Australia. Um, but that is going to be published soon through the Forestry Commission. Um, but I think, yeah, the prevention side is really important. So, you know, to what extent we can encourage people from a very, you know, children from a very early age to kind of engage with nature, be familiar with nature, 
see it as a resource for their well-being. Uh, I think that's really important so that you kind of have that throughout life because you know often that connection. Um, if you have it when young, you come, you kind of lose it as a teenager when you go on to other things, but you come back to it at some point. Uh, often people come back to it in their 20s when they start to have children, etc. Um, so I think, you know, there are still, you know, some people who are kind of less familiar with the forest environment, feel concerns when they're on their own in those sorts of environments. So that's sort of starting that engagement early. And think about it, this is a place you can go to for your mental well-being and, and getting that in across the life course, I think, you know, is really important. So not just for people who are diagnosed with something, because as you say, I think, you know, it's really hard to get access to mental health services unless, you know, it's really severe. Um, so, yeah, how raising that value, um, I think it is coming up the agenda and it is much more you know, taken notice of, and I think the kind of whole COVID pandemic, you know, does provide an opportunity for the environment sector to say, you know, how important green space has been to people um, during the various restrictions and not just getting out there, but seeing from the window, having plants in your house, etc. Yeah, and I think you're right, Liz, is your, how you connect to nature as a child predicts your behaviour as an adult. And yes, absolutely, it dips at teenage years. But if you haven't established that connection as a child, you're less likely to ever get that as an adult, but you will reconnect otherwise. And I think having access to green spaces, whether it's through forest schools, whether it's through access with your families on the local doorstep, in children, it also builds resilience, which is really important for long-term mental well-being. So I think it, you know, teaching that at a young age has got to be a good uh, approach for the preventative of future mental ill health. Thank you both. I've just, I was going to ask a question. I've just seen another question that I'm going to ask both of you now. Where are we? We're oh, 22, we're all right. Um, a question from uh, Villatati, who's asked, about developing countries, we talk mainly about sort of the UK and the West and certainly Europe. And uh, Vilatati's asked, how do you balance the system in a developing country in closing the gap on mental health, well-being and the forestry sector? I guess we're maybe more familiar now with these arguments about trees being good for you, therefore it's an investment, not a cost and everything. Have you got any thoughts, either of you, on, on the developing world and, um, and what, what can be done there, perhaps? Uh, Joe, I'll ask you first. Yeah, I have to, yeah, slightly, slightly a tangent from my sports science background, but, uh, but I mean, I think again, it's about understanding uh, the complexities of what you're dealing with um, in uh, those sorts of countries and, um, and, and how you could work together to maximize the benefits of trees, but addressing the different barriers um, that you might have um, to, to face compared to the UK. Um, so yes, I'm not much more to add, I'm afraid, than that. <laughs> My Liz is probably in a better position to, to contribute something constructive. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure. That is a that is a good one, isn't it? And I think you know there was a IUFRO um, International Union of Forest Research Organisations group on kind of health and well-being, um, and I, I kind of didn't actively engage with it, but they were looking globally, not just at kind of you know developed countries. Uh, which is where a lot of the research is focused. Um, but I think it's how do you kind of start some of those partnerships and conversations between the forestry sector and the health sector that focuses on mental health. Um, and again, you know, going back to the whole idea of connecting children um, with nature, you know, what is, you know, in the particular developing countries, what is that relationship of people, you know, to the forest? You know, is it about subsistence living? Is the opportunities for kind of leisure um, and thinking about, you know, yes, how do we like link in that sort of engagement with forests as a resource for mental well-being and as a resource for resilience? Um, so I think, yeah, there's kind of partnerships and maybe, you know, the sort of demonstration projects that I've talked about, you know, that have been happening for NHS Green Space in Scotland, for example. It's kind of starting something. 
um, a partnership and, and seeing what can be demonstrated in terms of those sort of mental health benefits and how you might link that sort of service with the forestry sector will be really interesting. <laughs> Thank you very much, Liz. Thank you, Joe. I think you talk about partnerships there is really important, isn't it? Because it's uh, it's you know the question was about developing countries, but it's it's about that exchange of information and working together and learning from each other as well, and not doing what has happened in the past, which is richer Western countries going to developing countries saying, "Well, this is what you should be doing," which weirdly doesn't always seem to end well. And we've got Naomi here watching. He's been doing some amazing work on the indigenous uh, tree names and, and various other things. Previous speaker and about indigenous wisdom, local wisdom, um, and that's something we need to be remembering as well because we don't always know best. Believe it or not. Okay, I keep going off these little rants by myself, but what I should just you know, I've, I'm the person who can click the button, so I might as well do it. Haven't I? Uh, right, where are we now? 20, oh, we've got a couple more questions. We've got a couple more questions we can do. Um, okay, a question specifically about biodiversity from Lenny that I will put to Joe. And the question is, thank you, Paul, I love in the rants. These are my well-behaved rants, Paul. These are the ones I do when I know I'm being recorded. You want to see the ones I do when I'm not being recorded. Um, Joe, Lenny is asking, when you talk about biodiversity, are you considering the environment of the biome? For instance, the high alpine tundra has limited species diversity when compared to the boreal forest, yet each natural environment provides benefit to both humans and the greater than human world. So are we just, I suppose, thinking about the human benefits or is it everything? We're looking holistically at this. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think the way forward could be to look at this holistically and, and this particular study, didn't it was just looking at the the human well-being benefits um it wasn't looking wider than that uh, so it yes it was very focused on that but i think you know that further down the line that's exactly where we should be headed that uh, you know looking at a multitude of benefits from all perspectives at a more holistic level rather than just focusing on on the human well-being um but yes so i think there's scope to do that further down the line Thank you, Joe. Okay, right, I'm going to ask one last question and then we'll do our final question. I'm going to ask a question from our very good friend, Edgar, who's over in Mexico. Hi, Edgar, hope you're doing well, my friend. Um, and I think this is maybe a, a kind of a big one. We've touched on it a few times, so I hope I'm not just repeating a question in a different way, but I do like it. Edgar's asking, how can we change the objectives and therefore the management of urban and peri-urban trees. If today it's saying that we're managing trees because they're ornamental, how do we actually get to a point where the objectives of managing urban trees are for well-being, biodiversity, ecosystem benefits and human health? How do we take that jump? Liz mentioned before about um, trees as a liability, then trees as a benefit. What do we have to do to really, I guess, to get this mainstream, to change the focus of management. What do we have to do next, Jo? Um, yeah, well, I think we've touched on, sorry, I, I looked distracted because I thought you were waiting for Liz to, to say it. Um, yes, yeah, so I think we've covered perhaps already the terms of this partnership and working collaboration. So I'm, I'm reluctant to sound like I'm repeating myself again. Um, but I think that is absolutely crucial because everybody has to be on the same page um, and to be able to reform those objectives rather than perhaps working in, in isolation on what they contribute to that. Um, but it's, it's more about bringing those partners together that all have something to gain out of it and agreeing mutually these new objectives um, of what trees can offer. Um, and I think that's the only way that perhaps they will get changed because at the moment everybody works in isolation and not collaboratively and that's not going to make those changes. Thanks Joe. Liz? Um, yeah I mean it's an interesting one isn't it? I mean we, there's been a big focus on ecosystem services now since the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in 2000 and we've had the UK National Ecosystem Assessment um, and then the follow-on projects, looking at all sorts of the economic value of ecosystems, looking at cultural ecosystems, looking at you know all aspects of those services. So I think that is part of the kind of discourse now that we talk about these 
ecosystem services. And in some, you know, we might not quite like the way it's all kind of separated into supporting, regulating, provisioning and cultural, uh, but it does kind of make us look holistically. Um, and so, you know, I don't know if Edgar thinks that's not happening as much in urban and peri-urban areas with trees than it is in trees in out with those places. Um, but I think it also comes back to that valuing and how we value these things and um, how we represent those values. Um, and whether that is kind of, you know, something that's monetized that kind of, um, you know, is um, gets into the treasury and how they spend money or whether it's kind of quantified. Um, I guess there is the whole kind of natural capital accounting that is now becoming more prevalent in the UK. So again, that's about, you know, valuing your ecosystem services and particularly focused on the monetary values. Um, and that's to kind of, you know, to feed into the kind of treasury to, to make natural capital kind of sit alongside, okay, you're looking at your, you know, green infrastructure, you're looking at your great infrastructure, you're looking at built infrastructure, and then you can kind of compare across them. Um, whether that's always the best approach that does leave out a lot of value. So it'd be sort of, I kind of keep seeing us going, you know, up and down, you know, we sort of, we talk about values and we've got to monetize everything. And then we do the UK national ecosystem assessment. It talks about all the things that can't easily be monetized. And then we get into a natural capital approach where we come back to monetizing what we can. Uh, so these conversations kind of wax and wanes, but I think, I think there is much more of a broader conversation now than there was before around all these benefits. So I'm kind of hopeful that that, you know, comes out, particularly, you know, in the UK with this focus on, you know, tree planting and treescape expansion. Thanks, Liz. Interesting. There's been a couple of points made in the, in the, the Q&A as well. So I don't think everyone else can see that. But uh, on that sort of theme that you've just mentioned, Liz, Naomi's saying, uh, as a member of the iTree team, it's critical that we focus on the value in terms of what our trees do for us in the larger sense, rather than the financial equivalent. So I think that's very important. And also one from Professor Maximovich about instead of monetary quantification of benefits, uh, perhaps it's more valuable to have quantifiable indicators on positive impacts of trees on particular types of diseases. So whether it's cardiovascular or respiratory, and I think that's a very interesting idea as well, isn't it? But I guess partly that's what we're doing with mental health. We're trying to link it very specifically to a particular disease and show how it benefits there. So maybe it's not just all about the, the money. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I agree. Okay, well, that's good. Everyone agrees. That's good. What a perfect time to what a perfect time to finish. So, um, right, there's a few people asking: uh, Are we going to be continuing this sort of discussion elsewhere? Well, at the risk of sounding like a dreadful salesman, we will be. We'll be doing it at conference. This is all part and parcel of a big build-up to conference. We were hoping that Liz and Joe um, would be joining us at conference, but for various reasons, when we we're going to do it in person, we couldn't, and then we're doing it here. So it's all very complex. But yes. Trees, mental health, well-being, this will all be big, important topics of discussion at conference, so please do come along. John at trees.org.uk if you need any more uh, information. But finally, before we go, we cannot let our speakers go without asking them our last and most important question. What is your favourite tree-related book, Liz? Uh, thanks for that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think I have two to mention that I'd like to mention because they're quite different. Um, so the first one is called Gossip from the Forest by Sarah Maitland, and she's an academic researcher. Um, and it's she's really interested in kind of fairy tales and folklore and superstitions connected with trees and forests. So her book is kind of um, chapters about her going to different forests uh, across the UK, sometimes with families, sometimes with friends, sometimes with uh, nature writers like Robert McFarlane. So looking at particular forests and her experience of them and interspersed with those are chapters on the retelling of European fairy tales. So things that people might remember from childhood, you know, tales about Tom Thumb, Rumpelstiltskin, and, you know, it's really interesting because it's about, you know, how these kind of fairy tales influence how we kind of see forests and connect with forests and some of that kind of scary uh, thing about forests, but sometimes about the kind of, you know, how forests kind of protect us from, from the outside world. So 
I just find it really fascinating. And then the other book that I'd want to mention quickly um, from a conference I went to, I think about three years ago, called Evolving the Forest. And that's what the book's called. And this was a really interesting forest uh, in southwest England, and it brought together a range of environment sector professionals, particularly forestry people, but also artists and philosophers. And so the book is kind of a mixture of things around kind of silver culture, around kind of polemics about philosophical discussion, and also about kind of poems and art, you know, things that artists have produced. So really interesting kind of mix and different ways to look at the forest environment. They're my two. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Liz. We'll let you have two. It's okay. Well done. Um, <laughs> Joe. Okay, so I think mine's going to be a bit left field here. Um, heavily influenced by having a seven-year-old son who absolutely loves nature, a surprise, surprise, uh, and being outside. And it's <laughs> Enid Blyton's The Faraway Tree, the set of books. So basically for anybody that might not, I don't know how, but you might not have ever read these as a child or have children that enjoy them. But it's about children who move to the countryside and their new house lies next to this enchanted wood that houses this magical faraway tree that is home to a sort of magical um, life full of elves, pixies, and they go on all these wonderful adventures with these talking creatures. So ever since my son showed some interest in reading, um, he has loved these books. And now he is forever climbing trees of any description to try and find his own magic faraway tree. So that would be mine. Joe, that is the reason that many of us got into arboriculture, hoping that eventually we climb a tree that was the faraway tree. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Some great choices there. Thank you so much. Um, Liz and Joe, great presentations, really thought provoking. So much information there. I really thank you. There's no doubt I'll be sending you emails asking you questions from our uh, audience in the next few days. So thank you to both of you. Thank you to all of our audience. You're all wonderful as ever. We love you all. Um, and hopefully we will see you in a couple of weeks. So not next week, but the week after. So thank you to all of you. Thank you, Liz and Joe. Thank you to Sophie behind the scenes as always. Thank you, everybody. And we will see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.